and hello to all the many people who are listening. Um, I think that I will take uh, a little bit the German perspective here today and uh, we'll start with a personal assessment on the coalition treaty in particular uh, everything that is written about China in it. And I would say maybe a little bit uh, in contrast to, to many other analysts that this coalition treaty is not a fundamental change or even paradigm shift uh, of Germany's uh, China policy. I rather see in this uh, coalition treaty some something like a strategic reset of the German policy towards China. And I guess that the most important goal of the new coalition is to uh, is develop a new China strategy, which is embedded uh, in the European Union and also in the process of the European Union. Uh, but the strategy is, uh, is not out there. There are some uh, ideas that you can get when you read through the coalition treaty. And I think one is that there is a strong uh, European focus uh, in the chapter on foreign policy. And I find personally particular striking that there is a focus on European strategy, uh, strategic sovereignty and European sovereignty. And this is uh, particular for people working on China quite important because it means that uh, the German government intends to strengthen European industries, innovations and investments uh, to be able to compete globally and uh, particular in the energy sector, the health sector, digital uh, and with digital technologies. And this of course is also changing a bit the game with China. Furthermore, European sovereignty is also understood um, as defending European values. And this is also written down in the, in the treaty. And I think it's quite important. Freedom, democracy, human rights are uh, mentioned uh, to be defended against um, non-democratic countries, and that of course includes China, but not only China, also other countries. Um, maybe as a footnote, human rights are mentioned all over the coalition treaty. So this is not only a topic that is important uh, towards China, but it's, I think, definitely, as I said, a strategic reset of German uh, policy, definitely an input that comes from the Green Party. Um, well, I guess that uh, the German relationship with China, as I said before, will be shaped in the European dimensions of partnership, competition, and uh, systemic rivalry. Systemic rivalry, the first time mentioned in an official document, that's definitely new. Again, uh, it has been discussed before the coalition treaty was signed several times within all parties. So I think it's more a strategic reset than, than a parad uh, paradigm shift. Um, also quite interesting, of course, the, um, the, the, the strengthening of alliances with like-minded partners, in particular with the United States. Although we have to say that we don't really know what they mean when they talk about transatlantic coordination on China. Uh, we don't really know if the expectations on both sides of the Atlantic are actually a match here or not. Uh, maybe just let me, uh, in the end, uh, say two hopes that I have. And the first hope is, um, and I personally think that we can actually see this in the coalition treaty, is that there's now a general understanding that geopolitical shifts, like the rise of China, the competition between superpowers like the US and China, are not just occurring around Germany and Europe. Uh, but that Germany and Europe are themselves part of these changes and that they also can shape these changes. And that's why the notion of European sovereignty is quite important from my point of view. It's crucial to, to uh, in the sense when you want to establish and defend European rules, norms and standards, and as well as future industries, especially in, in, Europe, in Europe's policy towards China. The second hope, and I'm not so sure if there's a common understanding among the three parties in that regard is even though there is this claim to establish an, a new China strategy, a more realistic and tough stand on China. I'm not so sure if on the other hand, um, communication channels and dialogue channels will remain open or even that there will be the uh, willingness to create new channels of communication because this is quite important, we all know this. I have been to China the last time two years ago in November, 2019. There have been no physical meetings between academics, between 
think tankers, there are several reasons why this is the case. One definitely is the pandemic, but still, uh, if the tensions rise on all sides, then um, this idea of shrinking communication channels, having the possibility to meet in person, um, that is definitely a problem. And I hope that dialogue uh, will be uh, one of the topics that this uh, coalition will also include in their new China strategy. And I stop here for now and uh, we can continue uh, doing the debate. Yes, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, I want to give the floor to Philip now for his uh, uh, opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Gotha, and uh, nice to be in such good company. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, indeed, the the uh, change of government uh, in Germany, uh, for all of us who are not experts in German politics, um, appears to be a bit of a game changer when it comes to China. But perhaps that's a, a, a misunderstanding. Um, what I'm hopeful is that um, the, the new coalition treaty that uh, Nadine just uh, discussed will, uh, will help uh, the EU to continue to, to pursue a, a coordinated uh, policy. And uh, particularly that uh, key European countries, uh, not just uh, Germany and France, but all, all the others, um, Italy, Spain, and so on, will, will maintain an agreed line on, on, on China. This is really what, what's been happening for the past two or three years, by and large, and wasn't the case before. Um, the general situation uh, for, for European nationals and European companies in China is getting worse, and not to mention for journalists and for um, academics. And there's only one way to deal with the current state of uh, Sino-European relations, that's, that's unity. I feel confident that the, the new uh, coalition treaty will continue to use the, the famous um, um, three-term triad definition, which um, I think Nadine also mentioned, uh, dealing with China as a partner, an economic competitor and a systemic rival. Um, but that's it was originally a German definition, I'm told. Um, I've heard that, that definition the first time in Germany, in fact, in 2017 or 2018, I can't remember, much before it became public domain. One thing that has changed, though, recently is the, is the attitude with, with respect to, to, to Taiwan, and uh, particularly with the, the flow of visits that have taken place recently from uh, the European Parliament to uh, the French Senate, uh, not to mention um, uh, the opening of a Taiwanese office in Lithuania, um, um, whatever happened with um, the Czech Republic, Prague, the city of Prague in particular, all these are, are, are new since um, many of the EU members over the past uh, uh, 20 years, I would say, uh, would not um, would not say a word about Taiwan or, or say very little. Um, this 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 is new in the sense that the um, coalition treaty is also referring uh, to Taiwan, uh, which you know wouldn't have happened. Um, I think probably not under Chancellor Merkel, but not under any chancellor over the past um, twenty years. At least that's that's my understanding. Um, the, you know, the fact that uh, Taiwan has been uh, mentioned so often, uh, of course, the fact uh, Hong Kong has also been mentioned. And in fact, there is a, a correlation between what happened in Hong Kong and the fact Taiwan has become this open space for uh, discussion about Chinese issues over the past uh, couple of years is interesting. Um, in addition, what, what, what's been happening in, in, in Xinjiang and, and, and in Tibet, I've, I've, I've also, well, Tibet, nothing new, unfortunately, but um, all, all these effects uh, uh, have, um, have led to um, 
politicians, elected politicians in Europe, to take a stance on this um, on these matters. Um, Berlin, I think, will somewhat um, break from the Merkel era, perhaps by working even more closely with uh, EU partners. Uh, it seems to me that the problem will be more of uh, coordination between the Chancellery and the Foreign Ministry, between Olaf Scholz and, and Minister uh, Annalena Baerbock. Um, so the three questions I would ask um, would be, first, what, what will happen to the comprehensive agreements on investment that Chancellor Merkel pushed through uh, when she was chair of the European Council uh, about a year ago, uh, if I remember correctly, it was December the 30th, 2020. And of course, that's now frozen due to an exchange of sanctions between uh, Europe uh, and China. Is, is there a chance for this uh, agreement to be ratified by the, by the time of, of the next uh, European Parliament elections in 2024? Uh, my answer would be no, but you know, if somebody is more optimistic, please uh, be happy to hear. And secondly, how prepared is Germany to commit some military um, um, deployments in the Indo-Pacific as a follow-up to the September 16 EU Indo-Pacific strategy? Now, this is not directly linked to China, of course, but this is also a sign that the EU is, is getting organized. Uh, on, on Asian matters as a whole. Um, and, and thirdly, uh, what will happen to Global Gateway? And we are here also on the big picture. Um, this new announcement that we've had uh, just a few days ago, 300 billion euro to be spent on infrastructure, on connectivity. Um, this is, of course, um, um, not openly a challenge to the Belt and Road Initiative from China, but obviously for those who follow these matters, uh, there is a connection. And I would, would ask, um, what is the plan behind these 300 uh, billion euro um, investments? I'm not sure there's one at the moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and look forward to the conversation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Philip. And I'm really very, very, very happy to welcome our guest, our third guest, who was unable to join for a while. So uh, we have John Wine also here with us, uh, very luckily. Um, and let me introduce him first. Um, uh, he is a network research fellow at the Center for Economic Studies in Munich, Germany. So uh, uh, he's also uh, uh, based here in Germany. Uh, previously, he was a uh, fellow at London School of Economics and Political Science and is at St. Edmunds College, University of Cambridge. Uh, he has done extensive research on the role of uh, the renminbi and also on the impact of Brexit on China's foreign policy. So um, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you, John, here. Oh, fantastic that you managed to join. Uh, it's so much better. I was, I was kind of uh, preparing to join you in through the mobile phone. But the floor is yours now. So opening statement. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Institute and to the uh, network for uh, extending the, um, the kind invitation to, to discuss. Um, I, I think uh, the previous two speakers have touched on some of the things that I was going to talk about. But um, I would say that um, uh, during the outgoing Chancellor Merkel's four terms in office, Berlin's approach to um, uh, Beijing was uh, somewhat um, um, a, 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 a very, um, a very uh, unsteady balancing act. Uh, and it was obviously coming off of the financial crisis that happened where German markets in in the Eurozone were becoming unsteady and that German business were looking for other opportunities in the world. And uh, trade and investment in China became one of its priorities. Um, in a sense, there, there was a certain, um, uh, uh, you know, there, there was that domestically driven kind of reorientation towards this uh, particular trading partner. Um, and the commercial kind of uh, real sort of a reality was 
often framed in this fandom to um, handle um, change through trade, relying on econ economic interdependence to bring about reforms in China's state uh, dominated economy. Um, and uh, I think that um, the new coalition has had an has had a look at this and, and obviously are not pleased, especially the Greens, at uh, what, what took place there. And there was an excessive emphasis on exports and investment in China, which uh, Merkel has now recently said was naive. And to sort of have the idea that, you know, economics and democracy are the two sides of the same coin, was was naive, um, um, and the idea that authoritarian political systems can't be legitimate. You know, if you're in China and uh, you're you're a fifty or sixty year old person, and you've looked at what the um, the Chinese leadership has actually um, delivered over this time, um, they feel that there is a certain degree of uh, legitimacy with the way things have gone because of the wealth and the standard of living rising. So um, I think that that's number one. So I think that will definitely be something that the um, the coalition is, is, is well aware of, although there's a diversity of opinion there about what will happen, uh, as has been pointed out, between the Chancellor uh, as office and the foreign um, foreign affairs office, which was demoted to a large extent under Chancellor Merkel, and this needs to be reinvigorated by the Greens. Um, two strands of German policy came together, sort of in the comprehensive agreement and investment between the European Union and China, signed at the end of uh, December 2020. Um, which was strange because we'd had a change in, 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 in leadership in the United States and uh, it seemed to be rushed through um, and not giving a chance for Biden to recalibrate the American relationship to the European Union, which was severely damaged by pres former President Trump. Um, so a lot of the issues surrounding this has become a problem because of Chinese retaliatory sanctions against EU parliamentarians and uh, civil society. Um, and this agreement's been widely, widely criticised for being pursued in haste, as I say, um, uh, before a chance to actually build a proper relationship with the Biden White House. Um, and what's happening now is really um, a striking kind of departure for, from the Merkel view of the world and China. Um, and um, the idea that this agreement cannot uh, take place at the moment uh, and that the coalition is looking for a stronger transatlantic coordination in terms of China policy. Um, and although the coalition uh, partners don't um, explicitly call for reduced uh, economic dependencies, they want to increase the strategic sovereignty of the European Union by having value-based foreign security and development and trade policies that reflect common European interests, quote, unquote. That link language suggests the three parties are aware that there have to be trade-offs between commercial advantages and advancing the broader goals of Germany's foreign policy. So uh, does that support for a more co coercive trade policy through the creation of a further development of autonomous trade policy measures against unfair trade practices at European level? We'll have to wait and see. But there seems to be a more clear-eyed and realistic view from the coalition uh, with its relations with China uh, and some values over commercial interests uh, need to be looked at. The commercial interests cannot continue at any cost. However, there is some narrowing gap between Germany's claims to be its values and the, the, re the behavior of the private sector in Germany, uh, which uh, is, um, you know, you can't ignore. So the coalition definitely highlights importance of a transatlantic economic relationship for global trading system 
and it says, together with the US, it declares we want to promote multilateral trade reform of WTO and the establishment of ecological and social standards, prosperity and the dynamism of sustainable world trade. That trade climate link should be central to cooperation as is further developed and underlined by the three parties, which say Europe should seize the opportunity to enter in intensive exchange with the new US administration uh, to promote trade and investment at a high environmental and social standards. Um, and obviously, this is going to be much easier post Trump and a closer alignment with uh, the Biden administration is going to be easier. So in conclusion, on foreign policy, Greens and the FDP and the SPD are wanting to strengthen the European Union. They also want to make the EU's foreign policy more efficient. And there may be considerable overlap on role of human rights it should play in foreign policy. Um, and both the FDP and Greens especially see China and Russia with a very critical eye. But on China and, Rus uh, China and Russia, the Greens want to propose this uh, strongly value-based approach, rejecting obviously Nord Stream 2, which is to say against EU geopolitical interests. And the SPD has got a more uh, ambivalent approach with that in terms of uh, the uh, with Russia uh, and support to somewhat the uh, controversial uh, gas pipeline project, which has been held up uh, by the regulator at the moment. Uh, and the Greens also support sanctions on Russia, especially in human rights violations. All this is going to come together, all this in the uh, long document and discussions about um, foreign policy, how to deal with aggression, will come to a head probably sooner than the coalition would have wished. Uh, because the reality is, geopolitical reality is, that the build-up of troops on the Russian-Ukraine border is, is probably going to uh, bring all these uh, uh, announcements to a head. At EU and at EU US level, um, uh, which the German administration, new administration, will have to look at and look at what kind of harsh sanctions they will actually propose if, if Russia goes ahead with any kind of uh, hostile geopolitical move on uh, Ukraine, never mind what might come down the line in terms of uh, China. Uh, thank you very much, Chan. Um, and it's really hot time we uh, went into the discussion bit because there is so much to talk about. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, what you started your statement with, uh, the idea of, um, of the uh, 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 of this uh, Merkelian policy of Wunder uh, durch Handel. Um, and um, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, it was the slogan of uh, the German policy towards China for the past decades, and it seems to be changing uh, and changing significantly. Um, uh, you also mentioned uh, it was a kind of balancing act, actually not just you, uh, the former two speakers also mentioned it. Uh, and uh, I think it could be our first topic to, to discuss. Uh, so uh, what kind of balancing act is uh, required for this newly formed government now? So uh, where would uh, the balances or what, what, what has to be balanced against? Um, uh, and I'm not sure which one of you uh, uh, wants to start this. Shall I be provocative a little bit yes, here? Yes, be provocative. I'm very happy about provocative statements. I, I, I think that um, 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 among many capitals in, in the world, DC, Paris, London, they look at pronouncements of German governments and it's a policy by um, um, word document. So basically they never put any heft behind any of this, they stay away from any kind of um, contentious issues because trade in the past has been so important for them. And I think they're gonna be called out on that in the not too distant future because you can't go on um, piggybacking on security 
from your allies without really contributing enough. And it's not only that how much money you spend, it's how effective is that spend in producing an outcome that can actually operationalize some of the things that you want to do. And in that, by Germany's own uh, uh, studies on the operational capability of the Army, Navy and the Air Force, um, Germany is not able to do that. Plus, it has a lot of problems with political elements in its security services and in its military. And so how effective uh, Germany is going to be in reality in operationalizing its, its wishes without the um, help of the United States uh, and other European actors is, is open to question. Well, yeah, if I may add, I mean, especially uh, with the, the CAI uh, not being through uh, and looks, looks unlikely that uh, everything will be um, unlocked for, for, for the next um, two years. Um, I think German companies uh, are facing the same difficulties in China um, as others, um, as foreign companies in general, more red tape, massive restrictions for um, expats, um, difficulties to transfer funds uh, out of the country, uh, technology transfers, uh, forced technology transfers, I would say, and so on. Um, and this will have to affect um, any elected politician. And this is the, the CI is actually a good reflection of this situation where you have on one hand, you can't have it both ways. You know, you, you, you're, you're trying to, to push a treaty that is actually supposed to be helping European companies um, in China um, rather than helping Chinese companies into Europe. That was the, the key. But the problem is you, you exclude the, the, the value side of, of the arguments and, and therefore it backfired uh, a few weeks later in the European Parliament and you know, in the media and you know, all kinds of circles. So um, since that, the, uh, the line has been in Brussels and in Berlin that we are um, uh, protecting ourselves. We have more and more uh, defensive mechanisms, whether it's on screening foreign direct investments, whether it's on uh, state aid, um, uh, technology transfers, um, uh, you know, 5G technology, all, all, all these things. But uh, what, what I'm worried about is more, uh, you know, where, where the, the balancing act is um, uh, to, to use uh, Agota's uh, line and, and whether we'll be able to, to, to have the two together. Um, and uh, it looks like at the moment, you know, we are good at, 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 at defending ourselves, not good at engaging ourselves with, with, with China. Yes, uh, let me add a couple of things to, to both of the um, comments. Um, I think, John, I agree with many things that you said. It's not so uh, conflictive, actually. I mean, if you read through the coalition treaty, that is, uh, it's, it's particularly wake on all these issues, how much uh, resources Germany really wants to spend, particularly when it comes to military and defense uh, and security policy. So, um, Again, I think this is not, you know, in a way, it's not that surprising if you think about the three parties that are actually, uh, that were actually behind the co coalition treaty. But honestly, I also think that from my point of view, um, the, the coalition parties and maybe Germany and probably the Europeans have realized that they are not longer, they are no longer the center of the world. I mean, military containment or the idea of, uh, of this military containment is not a European idea, at least not a German uh, idea. And I think um, you can't put this into a coalition treaty uh, so clearly, but I think you somehow have to talk around this. Um, and that is definitely uh, one problem. Um, regarding Kai, I'm, I, I think it's, uh, 
with the sanction in place, there's no way that that Kai is going to be signed. And I think that's um, we will also see we will who will be the new uh, German ambassador in in Beijing. That is also a, a very important question, I think, and probably one of the first decisions uh, Baerbock does uh, regarding China. So this will also send a message. So I guess. Uh, we will, we will see how this plays out. But I want to come back to another issue, and that is a very specific German problem. You both mentioned it, and I think it's, it's much more than just a, a conflict between the chancellery and the foreign office. I mean, basically for 16 years, uh, or, or maybe let's say the last 10 years at least, China policy and US and Russia policy was made in the chancellery. The foreign office was really weakened and um, that's why I think many things that are said by the members of the Green Party now, uh, they are somehow also a little bit, they sound a little bit desperate, because if you really want to have an effective foreign policy with an active foreign office, you need to reform the office. And uh, you need to, um, I, I mean, there are plenty of ideas how to reform the foreign office. We could go on uh, days uh, because the ideas are mostly on the table. But I think that is quite important. And when you read through the coalition treaty, I sometimes have the get the feeling that uh, at least the social democrats they know that they have the chancellery. So in many regards, you know, uh, maybe the rhetoric is more uh, tough in in the coalition treaty regarding China, and it's maybe uh, focused a lot on values. But in the end, um, I would I would say uh, Scholz was quite sure that. The first, at least in the first time of the of the uh, new government, uh, this policy is made in the chancellery. However, I would add, what is quite interesting is that one of the um, effects of Merkel's politics is that every other ministry now somehow uh, established some kind of China capacity. So uh, it's not only the foreign office that is interesting, it's also the Ministry for Development, the Economic uh, Ministry, even the Ministry of Interior, when it comes to national security, has uh, an important focus on China. So I think the diversification of Chinese policy within German foreign policy is the first thing that you need to coordinate before you even think about a united European approach. So. That is, uh, I think, when I think of balancing, I think that's the first balancing act. It's a horizontal balancing act. And I, I mean, we've said this uh, before, but I think it's still really important. And the second one, and I think this is also often um, forgotten, is uh, that we also need to establish a vertical exchange about the knowledge on China. And this means um, between the subnational, the federal and the national level in Germany, because we have the problem that most of the links and connections between Germany and China are taking place on you know, the subnational level. Of course, we talk about the car industry and the big global players, but if you look at the investment and the small and medium Chinese enterprises that actually invest in Germany, that is taking place uh, under the radar, more or less. And uh, I think that's also um, something that needs to be more coordinated when you really want to establish or develop a German uh, China strategy that somehow also will have an impact on Europe, because that, of course, is not only a problem in Germany. This is definitely a problem uh, in, in France, in, in other uh, um, European countries, in Poland, and so forth. So I think this is... Um, so the balancing act is a lot of these things are policy orientated, but there are also a lot of things that are really um, important when it comes to the formal process of how the decisions are actually made. And particularly in the German context, I think this is, this is a quite interesting time of potential change. But uh, I mean, we will see in six months, you know, if the office uh, shaped the person or the person shaped the office in many ways. And uh, I think this is... Uh, um, well, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, probably one of the, the the more interesting questions. Yeah, I stop here. <laughs> Can I add a, a word? Yes, yes. very quickly. Do, do, do so. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, um, Nadine um, on both issues. In fact, yeah. just as a personal anecdote, five years ago I went to Berlin and tried to interview people in different ministries to talk about China. This was this was in spring 2016. 
And to my surprise, only the foreign ministry and perhaps a little bit the defense ministry had such experts. But many people, many officials told me that they did not have teams in place. And perhaps for the reason you explained that the chancellor was basically capturing all the efforts and perhaps the German embassy in, in, in Beijing as well. This is an issue. And I think, you know, if I, if I may say, I think if you look at France, which is a more centralized country, of course, you would, you would see similar problems. Although the defense ministry, for reasons that we discussed uh, at the beginning of this event, uh, where you know, France is much more active defense player than Germany, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, the defense ministry has had this tradition of, of, of focusing a lot on, on strategic interest, of course, and not just um, in Europe, but around the world. And secondly, on the subnational element, same thing, you know, I would say that China has, has, has developed um, links with provinces, states, lenders, uh, regions, call it as you like, in all over the world. And this has been a very smart uh, move of course, it works better with decentralized countries than with centralized countries. But the result is that for you know, um, uh, most EU countries I can, I can think of, it, it's difficult to track down many of, the, of these um, links, of these operations, of these investments sometimes, but at least we have mechanisms in place now. But um, that's why you need some kind of national coordination because uh, same thing in the US, by the way, where, where it was based for six years just now. Um, you know, the governors have a lot of leverage when, when it means, when it talks to, when he, you know, when, when they, they talk to foreign countries and, and there's not much the, go the federal government can do. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, uh, I want to follow up on this point um, and, uh, and take us uh, one step further to the supranational level. Uh, you have all talked about uh, containment and engagement, and actually uh, also that it was you, Philip, mentioning that we are very good at protecting ourselves, but not very good at uh, engaging with China. So it seems that Germany is moving towards containment rather than engagement. But what implications would it have, might it have on the European level? Any one of you. Well, I don't. I I I I, I just want to sort of say that we are, we we when we are looking at these different levels, the EU level, what are we talking about? The the national governments we know and the subnational we know. Although some countries don't have a very strong governance system at subnational level, like Germany has. But I mean. Um, the EU level seems to be rather weak at some stage here. I mean, it, it, the leadership there is weak. And although the European Parliament has got active on, on, the, on this treaty, when we look at do we know ourselves well enough, that's what we're talking about here, because how many people will outside Germany know which which regions in, 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 in Germany have got the most uh, industry and, and the most Chinese investments, North Rhine-Westphalia, Bayern, and Baden-Württemberg, and probably has some because of financial services, and then you might have Mittelstand in a few other places. Um, but um, um, so there is a problem. I, I think that we have a difficulty with the leadership in, in the European Union to make a coherent strategy. And if we look at knowing ourselves and knowing what the business are doing, it was the BDI who flagged up issues in terms of China through their, um, their, 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 uh, uh, their uh, umfraga. They, they had a, 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 in the Chamber of Commerce, they, they looked at what the China, uh, German uh, business were doing in China and they flagged up quite a lot of issues that uh, I think Philip touched on a few of them there um, that were a real problem for them, right? Hiring staff in terms of, this, you know, the legal um, uh, protection that you would have in, in those countries. Um, uh, so 
uh, and, and the disadvantage that your businesses are at, at when they're in, in, in those countries. And this was not something that was very present in the political debate. And this, uh, you know, um, partner or competitor or rival issue really started to emerge out of the out of the frog because of what business was saying. And then this was German business who were saying, we've got problems with this. And they were the country that was, uh, they were the business group that were doing the best out of uh, investment in, in China and that they were finding it very, very, very difficult. So I, I, I think knowing ourselves is one thing. The biggest problem we have is knowing China. Right. And we may be overestimating where China is on its economic cycle at the moment, and that it's going to bump into a lot of difficulties and that its, it, its reactions to certain things. It's maybe some um, European capitals are thinking that they are, are getting quite exasperated over uh, uh, certain things. Maybe they're not as strong as we perceive them to be. Um, and uh, so when we look at GDP levels in, in global terms in the last 40 years, the, the areas that have lost GDP or, 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 or trade, let's say, uh, in the world, a very small amount has been America, the United States. But Europe and Japan have lost uh, to um uh, to the uh, to China, maybe because we've been too soft, we've been too open, we've been um, allowing them to to have their own way, and maybe this is where the line is drawn with this coalition that will change that in in Germany. Certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, you you probably heard last last week that the intelligence chief was making China number one threat to the United Kingdom, and number two was Russia, of course. So um, in terms of coming back to the EU, it's the leadership, it's weak. And it's really, you're looking, when you're looking at what the EU can do, you're looking at Berlin, Paris, and probably Rome now, that's coming into, into play because of Draghi being there, uh, about how this can move forward. But um, I mean, that's just now coming from outside the European Union, obviously looking in. That's how it seems now to 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 us. I mean, I've always been, you know, uh, saying that uh, Europe has its prime uh, uh, asset is its market, its consumer market, and 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 it hasn't escaped uh, the Chinese leadership for the past uh, forty years, apparently. And um, you know, obviously, um, there is a strong will at the moment from Beijing, uh, as as uh, most people in this call know, to to engage with with uh, with Europe, which may sound. Uh, a bit of a, as a surprise, but uh, because the Sino-American relationship is so bad, has has been really bad for the past um, three years now, and is not showing any sign of improvement. Um, the uh, the signals from China to businessmen from Europe to politicians, somewhat, uh, and even to academics like ourselves, uh, to me are clear that there is. A, a will from China to keep the link with, with, with Europe. At the same time, there is something going on in Washington this week, which I'm sure you know about, which is the, the summit of democracies. And that of course will gather a hundred countries, or should I say countries and provinces in one case at least, which is Taiwan. Um, and of course, uh, this, this is extremely annoying to um, the Beijing, uh, the government, uh, which has been criticized, of course, for uh, uh, not sending its um, um, president and, and secretary general of the party to Glasgow and to or to Rome in very important international gatherings, um, which has been criticized for, uh, um, you know, all kinds of things, really, for, for, you know, for not coping well enough with climate change and, and uh, with CO2 emissions, 
not to mention the World Tennis Association, the Women World Tennis Association, the story of Peng Shuai. So I think China is, you know, has to sort of is reassessing its international relations, and and Europe is is the best partner possible, uh, and for the good reason that the Chinese economy, to follow uh, on, on John's point, uh, uh, needs the European market. And remember that this was the prime. Uh, idea behind the Belt and Road Initiative to reach out to Europe, to European markets. And now, of course, it's a completely different story because these things evolve and change. But so I think, you know, if we're not prepared to engage, at least China seems prepared to engage. Um, so there's some hope. Um, but, you know, obviously, I, I also don't see any, any, any change in the, in the, in the global uh, regime's uh, policy, which is, of course, has... Uh, you know, brings some concerns as well. But anyway, this is this is my my global assessment, if I may say. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm always a little, I always hesitate, you know, if we think about, we underestimate China. I, I always uh, believe that we overestimate and underestimate China at the same time, you know, and uh, it's a, it's sort of uh, something that if you deal with China, and I guess both of you have uh, dealt with China much longer than I did, but uh, even for me, you know, this is something that follows you around. And uh, so I'm not so sure if that is a, is a good advice, you know, to always uh, think or, um, I don't know, uh, think about the underestimation or overestimation of, of, of China. But the, the other point that you made, John, I think is really important. And that is, of course, the, the knowledge about China and uh, how this is uh, diverse, diversified. And I think this is, um, it's actually something that is mentioned in sort of a small sentence in the coalition treaty as well, that they want to build up China competence or China capacity. But um, uh, we don't know how and we don't know um, if this is also going to be a European initiative or a stronger European initiative, which would be, I think, uh, the way to go uh, to particularly include smaller countries that don't really have this, uh, this academic uh, power than the big uh, countries in Europe. So I think this is an important topic. Um, I also believe that there's a big difference if we talk about um, the European market and uh, how we apply rules, standards and norms within the European Union and outside of the European Union. Philip mentioned the global gateway, which is orientated at the outside of the European Union, and that is definitely a, a, a different story. And um, I think what we can observe at the moment is sort of a competition of connectivity policies by um, even several uh, uh, um, connectivity strategies within the European Union, including the Indo-Pacific strategy, now the Global Gateway strategy. We have the Chinese uh, Belt and Road, which I would say is also a connectivity uh, project, uh, of course. So the United States that also want to, to build up uh, a better uh, connectivity future. So I, I think what is quite striking to me is that we are at the moment at a bridge or in a transition period where connectivity meets geopolitics. And I think the, the, the Chinese have understood this much earlier than the European did and also the United States did. They understood that connectivity is not just a means to reach something, it's not just an instrument, you know, it's a value as such. And if you control connectivity, connection links or linkages, then of course uh, you create new geopolitical space that you uh, that you also control, and I think this is interesting because connectivity is something that is transnational. This is uh, sort of doesn't know any boundaries, but geopolitics wants to determine and wants to define space and wants to show who actually has the power within this space. And this connection is something that is, uh, or this um, contradiction is something that the, the Chinese found a way to deal with. We can argue if this is a good way, if it's successful or effective, but the Belt and Road Initiative or the connectivity politics is a way to do this. I'm not so sure if the, if the European Union has found this, its way to deal with, with this problem. Within the European Union, we have a very strong connectivity project. I mean, the European Union is the connectivity project uh, when, when you wanna understand it that way. But I, I'm not so sure if we, if we can 
in a way um, use our experience and somehow um, well uh, exchange our experience with other parts of the world. So this there's a it's, this is really interesting because even with the one thing that we really did very well, which is connectivity within the European Union, we have a problem when it comes to 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 the geopolitical sphere, which I found quite uh, quite striking. Um, at this point, but I personally believe that really this connection between um, connectivity and geopolitics at the moment is really something that is transitioning the, the, the international order and China has, as it always seems an easy answer to it, but um, also definitely reaches some limits and I guess it's more important to also exchange views on this uh, between the United States and uh, Europe uh, and Europe also needs to talk with Russia, uh, engage with with uh, with neighbors, and um, particularly in this case, also engage with China. Uh, thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, that would be actually my final question. Our time is running quite tight, so uh, I wish uh, you could uh, respond to it quite briefly so that we could have uh, enough time for Q&A. Uh, but that's exactly the point I wanted to reach at at the end of this discussion time. Um, uh, this big picture of uh, uh, China, uh, EU, Russia, and uh, the United States. So uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what trends do you see there in terms of uh, what Nodin has just brought up, uh, geopolitics uh, and or connectivity? So uh, uh, what is the way you visualize um, this? So, so I, I'm seeing a, um, a question from Jeffrey Anderson who um, uh, who's brought up the uh, what about Macron's argument that Europe needs to be built up as a third power between China and the US. And I think this is a very important uh, question because we remember when Macron was, was uh, in the campaign and, and a lot of people in Berlin were very keen on Macron winning, not least because it meant that Le Pen wasn't president. Um, and he went to extraordinary lengths to actually put out his vision about how he saw Europe. But this, um, this view was never reciprocated by the Germans. It wasn't reciprocated by the British, but for different, different reasons, because they were on their way out. Um, but I think it's an important one now, because there are a lot of things that you see in the coalition agreement, and there's a lot of things that went on in the German campaign that may show that um, uh, Germany may be more receptive to this uh, view that Macron has. Now, we know he's in the midst of a, a, a political fight. We know that he's going to have to concentrate on that. But at the same time, if Europe is going to be taken seriously, then fundamentally, whether the rest of Europe likes it or not, Germany and France must walk hand in hand, not just in words, but in actions, in terms of pushing forward a, a space in between, as, um, as Jeffrey mentions there, and I'm sure Jeffrey can say this better than myself, but um, between China and the US. And that is fundamental. And now we've got this relationship between um, uh, France and, 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 and uh, Italy emerging. We've got other actors in Europe that may be of the same mind. It would be very important for Europe's voice to be taken seriously if it was seen that some of the major powers within the European Union were, um, were, uh, were working towards these problems, geopolitical connectivity, whatever you want to say, uh, uh, were working hand in hand and making a strategy that worked. At the end, uh, um, he, he says that, um, uh, at least one other uh, uh, Britain would be involved in that, maybe in intelligence, maybe in military. But while, unfortunately, while we have a prime minister who is not so disposed to making connections and alliances within Europe and more inclined to make problems, I think that, that one is uh, probably not a, a runner at the moment. What is important is that Europe gets a firm footing uh, and is a contributor, and the world sees that Europe is acting uh, as a, a, 
and, and it's got a lot of goodwill in the world, the, uh, the European Union, but especially maybe France and Germany would be seen as an alternative to always looking at the US and China. I know that from a military perspective, that's not possible. From a hard diplomatic perspective, it might be difficult, but I think it is fundamental for what our relationship, us as Europeans, is going to be with China and the United States, that the United States sees that um, the, the Europeans are just not all talk, that there is substance there, and the Chinese see that maybe that Europe is not such a pushover in, in the future, and maybe uh, they have to look at it in a different way than they have done in the past. So, uh, so pre presumably, uh, um, uh, I guess the Indo-Pacific strategy is is really uh, an answer to this. And as you may know, uh, uh, um, France will chair the European Council from um, January first, and uh, there is already a planned um, summit of uh, mainly of foreign ministers, but possibly with a few prime ministers of the Indo-Pacific region talking to EU countries in February in Paris. Um, and, and I'm sure you're also aware that last week, uh, uh, Stefano Sanino, uh, the head of the um, EES, uh, European External Action Service, was in Washington trying to um, find some common ground uh, with his um, US counterparts, and particularly Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, and it was all very polite, and and you know, and they, they said you know we're, we're better together than than, than not, uh, which is kind of obvious. Um, but the reality is that yes, there is a, a European approach to uh, to things, um, um, and uh, it's it's been unfortunate really the past uh, uh, year uh, under President Biden when it when it dealt with uh, Europe and with Asia at the same time. It's been basically one-sided, you know, it's been, it's been a continuation of America first, uh, despite the language, which was different. <laughs> um, so from, from the CHI to the AUKUS, the uh, um, Australia-UK-US partnership announced um, in, in September, um, a day before the EU Indo-Pacific strategy was, was to be announced. This is very unfortunate. Uh, um, diplomacy from Washington, and I'm saying that as a friend of the U.S. But uh, I, I have to say this: this is uh, this is quite uh, this has been quite bad for the transatlantic relationship, and and it has helped the third way that uh, Jeff uh, Jeffrey uh, mentioned in one of his questions to to be built, and it's it it has perhaps encouraged the uh, what he calls the, 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 the Macron argument, but it's not only Macron. Fortunately, there are a few others, otherwise we're not going to go very far. Um, so there is this being built, but the problem is, you know, there are 27 members. And uh, again, you know, uh, whether um, the 27 will, will be in agreement and we'll, have, we'll be able to uh, uh, bring together uh, their, 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 their military means when needed, their economic means when, when needed, and that's where the Indo-Pacific strategy is important. It's not just about military, because we, we can't be in a military power in the Indo-Pacific, obviously. Um, so, you know, I think all these circumstances make it easier for the EU to emerge as a possible um, third player, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a long march, basically. I, I'm sort of a little bit more critical about this idea of Europe as a third power. I mean, uh, I agree a lot with what Philip said. Uh, basically, Europe is more than France and Germany. It's a, it's a, it always seems an easy way out. You know, you have the big countries, they come together and somehow they are the leaders and then the other follows. But uh, I think the last 15 years showed that this is simply not working in, in, in that way. And uh, so I guess the, the European trauma is that you can discuss and be more geopolitical and you can even discuss a geopolitical strategy towards China, but you're not part of the geopolitical game. And that's the contradiction somehow you live in, you know, I mean, it's maybe different for, for, uh, for, the, for, 
for the for France and from a French perspective, and there are probably more. Um, uh, there's a more probably a more a different understanding, but if you look at Europe, I think this is the this is the trauma that you're in, and um, so one way of dealing with this is, of course, emphasizing the rules, um, trying to somehow translate what is important to Europe in this international order to the next one, and trying to uh, safeguard this and. I don't see how you can, you know, make a military actor out of the European Union and with everything that you that you say when you talk about a third power, it implies the 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 military the military aspects, even though we can always uh, debate around it. Uh, this is one thing I I think is quite um, quite important uh, to me. The other is when we include Russia and. Um, what I found quite striking, again, going back to the coalition treaty, is that, yes, uh, it's very critical towards Russia, but it also opens a window of engagement towards Russia. Uh, there's uh, the idea of um, talking to Russia um, regarding planetary challenges, for instance, or about certain global topics. And I think this is uh, exactly uh, the 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 problem that we also have uh, with China, even though it's not mentioned in the paragraphs on China. So, and maybe even on the paragraphs regarding the United States, we need to talk to 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 all three partners from a European perspective, um, and we need to start develop. Uh, probably alternative channels of, of, of communication. It sounds a little bit weird to say this because there are so many mechanisms but mechanisms in place, but I believe if we look at the tension that is and the emotion that is now um, somehow um, presenting as some kind of new Cold War atmosphere, and I'm only fo focusing, highlighting the atmosphere here and not everything regarding the structure of the Cold War, then it's even more important to, to, to find ways of how we can still communicate with each other. And I mean, as far as I know, the United States are talking to the Russians, they are talking to the Chinese, they established this kind of challenge uh, channels. And I guess it's important for the European Union to do this. But the problem is, as Philip said, there are 27 members and uh, you need to have them on board when you talk to, to the other big players because uh, otherwise they, they simply do what the Chinese and also the United States have done in the past. They, well, they <laughs> divide an emperor. They sort of play with us uh, as they need to play. They play with uh, with the different uh, positions in Europe. So, um, yeah, well, it's a trauma of Europe, but I guess what the German government can do is definitely trying for um, channels of communication in all directions and trying to engage, even though it's getting more difficult, because um, at least from my understanding, um, it's where diplomacy uh, starts or should start. Thank you very much, Nadine. Um, yeah, um, that's exactly the point uh, where uh, we can uh, take a look at our question. 